being aware of the physical body, in particular becoming aware of the connection that your body is making with the ground beneath you, with the chair beneath you. And then from those deep roots, a sense of growing tall, gently elongating through the spine and the head placed just nicely on top of the spine. Feeling a softness, a relaxation spreading throughout the body. The face and the jaw soft and relaxed. Taking your awareness to the breath. Noticing now the natural rhythm of the breath. Being aware of the path of each inhale and the path of each exhale. And aware of the little pauses, those little moments of stillness that lie in between each breath. And then placing your awareness in the heart space. So the very, the very center, the core of your being. Have a sense that you're placing your awareness there. Feeling awareness there. Ready to receive two mantras, two verses. Um, and this is the first one, so I'll chant it three times, and then I'll give you a, a rough English translation that captures the, the general flavor, the general spirit of the, the mantra. Om Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtaye Nishprapanchaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase Om Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtaye Nishprapanchaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase Om Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtaye Nishprapanchaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase Niralambaya Tejase Niralambaya Tejase Om I bow to the presence of Shiva, our true and highest teacher, 
that lives in and around us as being, consciousness, and bliss. It is ever present and radiates peace, lighting the way to transformation. Om. And the second mantra we're going to explore is an affirmation mantra that originally comes from a, a text known as the Mantra Tantra Prakashana, or the light on the expansive power of mantra, a, te a text which unfortunately is lost. There's no surviving manuscripts. However, this, this one mantra was preserved in a later text, a medieval text. So that's why we still have it. And the mantra is as follows. Again, I'll, I'll, chant, I'll chant it three times. And then give a, a, a translation. Aham devo nachanyosmi brahma ivaham nashokabhak satchitananda rupoham nitya mukta svabhavavhan Aham devo nachanyosmi brahma ivaham Nasho kapak Satchitananda rupo ham Nitya mukta svabhavavan Aham devo nachanyo smi Brahmaiva ham Nasho kapak Satchitananda rupo ham Nitya mukta Svabhavavan. I am the divine. I am nothing else. I am not a receptacle for fear. For I am the absolute alone. I am made of being, awareness, and bliss. My truest home is my own, own self, who is always and forever free. And then a mantra that everybody, of course, can join in with, chanting the mantra on three times. So, breathing deeply in. Uh.
that. From that, you can gently bring your awareness back to your surroundings, gently opening the eyes, moving the body, fingers, toes. And then from there, I mean, you, you can continue if you'd like to, to, to sit in a more uh, meditative style posture. Um, or if you would prefer, then of course you can sit in a more <laughs> relaxed posture in your armchair, etc. So, um, can you give me maybe a sign of thumbs up if you received readings for this session. Um, okay. So I did, uh, well, what I'll do is I might screen, screen share. So bear with me as I try and do that. Lovely. So I, I, I think how, who here has attended previous sessions of this study group um, is it just is it just tracy or rebecca or sarah did you attend any previous sessions of tarka okay so in that case um i'll just give you a broad overview then of the of the text which we're currently looking at um so that this is a text called a uh, the, the Tantra Sara, or the essence of Tantra, the essence of the Tantras, um, composed by um, Abhina, Abhinava Gupta, who was a great Tantric master, a scholar, um, not just in Tantra, he was also a scholar of uh, other things, such as the field of aesthetics. And he wrote a great deal of many works, uh, the greatest perhaps of which, and certainly the longest, is the Tantra Loka, um, Light on the Tantras, um, which really is it, m m most people would, scholars in the area, would probably. Um, agree that, at least from a philosophical point of view, anyhow, this period um, epitomized by Abhinava Gupta was kind of the high point of, 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 of Tantra, of Shaiva Tantra at least. Um, but Tantra had been around for several centuries by the time Abhinava Gupta came along, so he had a lot to draw upon. And what he essentially did was by the time he came along, Tantra diversified into lots of different branches, as, as these thing, things tend to do. And what he really did was to synthesize um, and take various teachings from different tradi traditions. But his main, his main uh, um, tradition, as it were, was the Trika, what we call the Trika lineage, the lineage of the Trinity. But also he drew a lot upon the Krama lineage. And if you want to find out more about what those are, um, well, some of you have already attended um, talks that I've done on the origins of the uh, history of Tantra. And I'm still hoping to, re to record one of those so that you have it as a resource. Or in the meantime, there's also um, this book by Harish Wallace called Tantra Eliminated, which um, 
for this reading group, you know, is a really valuable resource. Very, um, really a good idea to, to have a read of that book. So this Tantra Loka is a huge work, um, so huge that Abhinavagupta himself so, soon realized that he had to write a shorter version. So and this is what this is, the Tantra Sara, where he kind of captures the es essence of what he, was, what he wrote in that earlier work. So it's a, it's a summer, it's a very detailed uh, summary of, of the tantric tradition, essentially. And we've been working very slowly <laughs> our way through this text. Um, but that's okay. There's no, absolutely no rush at all. We had a look at the introduction. Um, in the last session, we had a look at uh, chapter one. Um, actually, it's the chapters are divided uh, into, as you may see on the screen, day one, you know, day two, day three, etc. So I'm not going to go through the whole of the introduction in chapter one again. Um, but, feel, but please do, if you haven't got the readings, then I can supply them and you can have a good look at intro, the introduction in chapter one. Well, we will go over these key points, you know, key points in the introduction and chapter one. Right, so in the in introduction, Abhinavagupta kind of plunges straight in. He doesn't, uh, um, as, is, as is usually the case in, the, in these ancient texts, um, he just goes straight into what he want, what the goal is um, of, the, of this path, of, of this text. And the goal is this insight or realization has been the sole cause of liberation. And, that, and that's, what, that's what we're after as, as, a, as a, a tantric practitioner, um, is this thing we call liberation. And furthermore, um, if you're a, a left-handed tantric, or at least, liberation whilst we're still alive. Liberation whilst living. Jivan Mukti. So, and the way and the way towards this for Abhinavagupta is this thing we're we're calling we're translating as insight. Insight that is into reality, into non-dual reality, that realization that everything is one, everything is Shiva. Everything is consciousness, whichever word you, know, you prefer to, to give to this. Um, everything is part of it, including our own innermost selves. The root cause of suffering, the cycle of suffering, suffering is ignorance. Um, referring here to, not to, not to, uh, ignorance of factual knowledge. Yeah. What he's talking about is a spiritual ignorance here. I, we still continue to see ourselves as separate. Um, the false sense that individuality e equals separation. And then the various mental constructs of vikalpa that arise from that. So this word vikalpa, um, some of you will be familiar with it. So it's a term that also appears in, in yoga, in Patanjali's yoga. Um, here in tantric yoga, it's 
it's referring to all those stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves that lead us away from the truth of things. And, and most of us, to some extent or another, carry such vicalpas, such mental, mental constructs with us. So this leads us on to the next point there. Removing this fundamental ignorance is contingent on the cultivation of mental discernment regarding what is to be let go of here on what is to be held close upadea. So that discernment is what we mean by taka. That's the name that I've given to this study group. That's, uh, that's the word that means um, discernment, really. This kind of, this kind of intellectual or, or more than intellectual discernment of, of yeah, what, we, what, what we need to let go of, what we can let go of, and what we must hold on to. So that's part of what we're here for studying these texts in these Tarka sessions. The central insight to, become, to be cultivated by all is that one's innermost being is Shiva. So that's just the name that um, these, this, this group of practitioners, philosophers, preferred to give to this absolute consciousness. Um, you know, if you prefer a different name, then you can substitute that with a different name. And this Shiva, it, it, the nature of the Shiva is the light of consciousness, i.e. that non-dual, uncontracted, unlimited awareness that we're attempting to access through these teachings and through these practices. The teachings of the Malini. So what's the Malini? Well, that's referring to a, tan a, a particular tantric text um, that we call the Malini for short. It, ha it has a longer name, but for short, we can call it the Malini. Um, and that's Abhinavagupta's main source text. Yeah. That's his, that, he, he claims that himself. That's his main source text for his work. He draws upon other texts, but this is the main one. And this is a text that still survives. Um, if, you, and if you want to see the original um, text of, this, of the Malini text, it's been recently translated by um, Somananda Vasudeva, who's a tantric scholar, uh, now these days at Kyoto University. And his PhD is accessible online for everybody to, to view, if you should wish to, where he translates that text. So that text is said to contain the essence of all the, all the Shaiva scriptures. According to Abhinavagupta, it does. Um, and, they're con and these teachings are conducive to liberation. And they are presented clear, clear, clearly in the Tantra Sara. And they are, although, as is often the case, um, so what Abhinavagupta is writing here is, an exige, is a commentary um, on this previous scripture, the Malini. And as often happens, you know, he does give his own little spin on, on things. Um, for, exam for example, it, it's not clear that the Malini is presenting a non-dual doctrine at all. Um, but that's what having ever got to reads out of it. 
full awareness of the real of this real self you know this real inner self the shiva self is liberation or at least it's the first and most fundamental phase of liberated awareness so that was all in the introduction And then we had a look at chapter one last time. And there will, there will be points during, it's not just me talking, there will be points uh, later on where I will ask for any points of, you want clarifying or questions? But for now, just bear with me. So key points in the chapter one, or day one, the teachings of day one. The essence nature of all beings is that light of consciousness, which is one, indivisible, independent, unlimited, all pervasive, eternal, and formless. The, its powers, i.e., the powers of the divine, or its five shaktis, is the Sanskrit word, um, are, are as follows. The power of awareness, the power of bliss, the power of willing, the power of knowing, and the power of acting. So these are the standard five uh, shaktis, the five powers of the divine five powers of of god if you happy to use that word um complete full awareness complete bliss now that's the that's the english way of translating the word ananda and i always never too quite sure about this word this translation as bliss just because a bliss a blissful experience is often associated with something um that's very that's very pleasant you know well very 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 pleasant <laughs> um, um really desirable to the senses um, for example you know if you go and have a, a really nice massage you might come out saying that was bliss or you might go on a beautiful holiday um, on that lovely island that you were on Tracy a moment ago <laughs> and that was absolutely bliss um, and uh, for me, Ananda is, 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 not, is not quite this. It's referring more to this deep, inner, constant uh, sense of joy and contentment. Yeah. Not just in blissful experiences, not just in you know, those peak experiences, but in the, something that you can access, you know, potentially in even in mundane experiences, even in painful experiences, you can still access Ananda. And then the power of willing. Um, consciousness has, has this innate will, this innate desire. The power of knowing of course the divine by its nature is all-knowing and this power to to act the power of the shakti the power of acting so these are i've said that the powers of the divine the powers of god but of course they're also potentially you know powers of our the powers that we ourselves can access as we are part of that we are um the divine we are god in that sense so um we're looking to 
through our practice, through, through this path, following this path, we're looking to fully access these powers of awareness, deep bliss, willing, knowing obviously we can't know everything but we can know and be happy to know everything that we need to know when we need to know and the power of acting yeah, obviously we're not all powerful we're clearly not in control of everything and um, that's ever so clear at the at the moment but we do have We do have the potentiality to, once we're tuned in with, the, with that divine nature of ours, you know, to act, um, to channel that, uh, as it were, that divine essence through us. What, what, does, what does the divine, what does Shiva want to express through us? So these five powers, uh, they're quite an important teaching of the tantric tr tradition. So I did think about focusing this entire session on them. I did consider that, but I really wanted to focus on these, this next teaching, the teaching of the Upayas. So if you do want to know more about those five powers, then again, um, I, I point you towards Tantra Illuminated, where they're further described. But for, for just for now, we'll move on through those points, key points in chapter one. So that light, that light of awareness, appears in a contracted form as the individual self, our individual self which is a means, however, to come to know the true self. Which is what I practice, in, if we're following this tradition, is aimed towards. And the method of manifesting the unbound, unbounded light of consciousness in and through an individual being is that of actualizing the powers of willing, knowing, and acting as the three modes of immersion into reality. So what, this, that, what those key points don't make very clear is that at the end of chapter one, so hopefully you all see my screen share here. At the, End of chapter one, Abhinavagupta starts talking about these three modes of immersion, these three methods, which we're particularly focusing on today, the three upayas, the, di the divine, the empowered, and the embodied methods. And don't worry, we will be looking more at those in a moment. But he does introduce them here at the end of chapter one and the next the next four chapters of this text the tan the tantra sara text are completely dedicated then to exploring these four methods so chapter yeah there's actually four methods not three but one of them is as we will shortly see is actually a non a non method Chapter two looks at that non-method, and then chapter three looks at the divine means, chapter four looks at the empowered means, and the fifth chapter looks at the embodied means. Yeah, so if you, if you carry on with these study groups, then we'll be looking at these for quite some time now. So that's why I thought it was quite important at this point just to step back and have a look at... Uh, have a closer look at these three upayas before we move further on in the text.
Okay, so on your screen, do, do you, yes, any questions on what I've said so far? And of course you can, well naturally you can unmute yourself. Seeing if I can see the chat box. Yes? Ben, just one question if I may, that was really interesting, thank you. Um, there was uh, just something you said um, about our aim is to be liberated whilst living. Hmm. So is that to be liberated from our disconnection with true self or to be liberated from suffering or what's kind of the, the key word here? What are we being liberated from? Or ignorance, is it? We're being um, freed from ignorance? So... So, well, kind of all, all of those things, really, in a sense. I mean, free, freedom from further suffering, yes. But freedom from suffering, yes, by um, realizing this and becoming to, realizing this true self, our essence, nature. And freeing ourselves, yeah, from that wrong, uh, well, the... You know, the, from in you know the unhelpful. I I, I always you know, he, he, hesitant to use the word wrong, <laughs> unhelpful ways of looking at things. I mean, you know, helpful states, um, states of mind. Um, and and the overall state of mind or ignorant thinking of mind is that we're dual rather than um, one. So. Uh, so the ignorance is the separateness, whereas the liberation is, uh, and the wisdom is that we're all one, we're all part of Shiva. Yes, that's right. That's, yeah. Thank you. And that's what, what, it, what it's referring to, yes. Because, uh, I, I, might, I might just add, just, uh, just to put things in historical context, the, the earlier, some of the earlier tantric, lineages, um, what we call that the right, what we normally call the right-handed Tantra, um, didn't, didn't believe in that such liberation was possible whilst alive. You know, liber liberation was something that you reached after death. <laughs> um, so that's why this, this, these left-handed lineages are, uh, yeah, provided a different perspective on that, and said that there are, yeah, there are there are practices we can do. There is a path we can take that will bring us to that full liberation. Yeah, whilst living. Yeah. And as I said, that's that's essentially where this where we were talking about you know Jiva Mukti <laughs> Yoga, weren't we? Before the talk started, and I mean that's where that term Absolutely. initially originates. Actually, yeah, yeah. that's definitely there. Their philosophy. Yeah. So, is there any other uh, question? Yeah. Can I can I just ask you something, Ben? Uh, yes. Um. So, Christopher Wallace at the moment is doing some sessions on YouTube, um, called Office Hours. Mm. Um. And he was asked a question by somebody this last week um, about why some traditions get further than others in terms of realization and Christopher Wallace quotes the amount of tattvas that there are in the tantric traditions as opposed to Patanjali and although he says Patanjali is right it doesn't go far enough and there's always further to go so my question is then that if it is possible for some people to have, um, on rare occasions, a very, well, a complete descent of power, how is it even possible to go any, f to go any further? <laughs> Because if you're there, 
Mm-hmm. How could you? Or or are there, or or is it that you could never know that you really were? And he he didn't he didn't answer it absolutely totally because he said that chapter eight of the recognition sutras sorts of deals with that. Mm. But he says it's to do with humility and that that is the most important Tarka to know. Okay. And I'm sort of, well, if you could be there, how can you, how can you not be there? Well, so that, yeah, I mean, that is a, yeah, that's a, a very interesting question you've raised. Tracy, uh, it's dangerous having me in a lockdown. We'll be, <laughs> just to clarify, we'll, we'll, we'll be in a moment. We'll be we'll be looking at that uh, um, mean that method or non-method that you're kind of referring to the per, the rare individual who kind of just gets it, as it were, straight yeah. away. Um, but as you say, and in the the. In the in the in the, the tantric line is that there is like a hierarchy of, of teachings, isn't there? Because yeah. as well, it says it it appears in the recognition sutras where they place the various schools, um, the Buddhists, the Vedantins, the Sam, the yogis, and Sam Samkhya followers, and then obviously they place themselves at the very top. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean that is a very interesting uh, quandary. But Joe seems to be about to think, say something. I think from most of us have these experiences, but I think the the, the trick is that you have the experience, and um, and then you don't you don't dwell in it. You sort of have it, it and then it's fleeting. So mm -hmm. so you want to be able to live your life constantly in that realization and and to do that it takes it, it takes a, a lot of work um to realize that we're not not separate so i think there are maybe one you know one percent or probably less of the population that that realize that, that they're divine and and can live in that divinity and has and 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 they don't they don't lose it and come back to all their fears and all the stories that they tell themselves but for most of us we'll have that experience of feeling unbounded and one and then we get pulled back into our everyday lives and um when we get pulled back into our everyday lives then the trick is how do you how do you you continuously live or, or and and that's what the practices are there for um, I think because I think well, everyone's had that experience of feeling unbounded um, but the trick is and I think Harish has even said that in I've heard him say that mm. it's like you have the experience and you realize that you're consciousness and that you're the light of awareness um, and then it's just a case of and then you go back into your daily life and all the things start happening to you again and you forget that and then it's a case of remembering it and trying to embody it all the time and and, and by embodying it it shouldn't be a chore it should come naturally mm. um, as well sort of thing it should be something that just happens very naturally but because of our conditioned minds it's very very hard mm. so can i just yeah, make a do. response yes. to tracy's question please. i was thinking about uh, when I, I've been having got to my say, <laughs> um, and this is shame we can't reach out and ask him. Definitely. But I suspect that given what he's about to tell us, that he would accept that a follower of any of those of the paths, traditions, could also reach full awakening yeah, very quickly, whether they're following you know, the classical yoga path, the Buddhist path, mm -hmm. uh, Christian path, or maybe even you know, no, no an path. atheist path yeah. um but i think he would also he would nevertheless say that he would still probably say that the the shiva tantric path offers the most comprehensive <laughs> uh, 
yeah, the most complete set of teachings and therefore most likely the mm -hmm. one most likely to lead to full awakening. But Thank you. of course he was going to say that, isn't he? <laughs> May I just add as well? Mm. Um, certain lineages like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras also recognize that there are different steps for different people. So he offers the one step plan. Mm -hmm. He also offers, or, or the sutras, offer the three step plan. So the one step plan is for the more ripe student. Or, um, and, and then the three step plan is, is for those, most of us who, who need that little bit extra. Um, and then also um, regarding Trace's question about how do you get further once you've, um, once you've got there, this is a question. Um, are, am I right in thinking that there are different states of samadhi? So there are different states of enlightenment that you can also um, mm -hmm. acknowledge. And then, and then also regarding uh, yes, uh... what Joe was saying um, about kind of that realizing that you're connected and then losing it again, it kind of reminded me about when you're meditating and then you realize that, oh, I'm here. And then you lose it because the mind's taken over mm. and told you that you're there. Mm. So you can't be there anymore because your mind's taken over and told you that you're there. So that, that's just, yeah. But um, am I right in thinking that there are different levels of samadhi or different states of samadhi? Yes, there is a number of progressive yeah, stages described, yes. Does that mean another mm. group that do that, or is that just Patanjali? Is that in Patanjali's yoga sutras? Um, or, or does that mean other people do that as well? He talks about uh, different grades of um, what we call Shaktipat, oh, yeah, um, awakening, yeah. which is a term that we'll... Yeah, is it chapter four he talks about it? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, sorry, who... Is it chapter four? He talks Patanjali's. about states of awakening. In Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Yeah. Yeah, mm. they're, they're, they're in there. They're in, yeah. yeah, I think he talks about four different stages and, and just never to um, live in this sort of um, awareness that it, any of the states are permanent and to have the well the humility to recognize it's a fluctuating process of yeah. moving back and moving forwards again it's not a permanent thing yes and, and with regards to your point about uh, uh um rebecca about patanjali uh offering the different steps for different uh, people different aspirants well yes that that is yeah indeed the case and it's uh, in fact it's, it's a very common te pedagogical or teaching tool actually that uh, yeah. um, I mean the Buddha was was for, you know well known um, apparently for being able to give very different teachings to to different people who came to him, uh, depending on what he f what he saw that they need, what they needed, particular um, what needs of the student. So, yeah, there's nothing in that respect. There's, it's not completely. Well, these upayas are not unique to um, Abhinavagupta. So, can people see the three ways to freedom? On the screen, is it being shared? Yeah. Or maybe you have your own copy anyhow. So this is a this is a, a blog post written by uh, Harish Wallace, uh, and I thought it was just a really nice introduction to these three methods or means or or pies. So we'll have a look, look for it together here. And then once we've looked for it, then again, we can open up for some more discussion. 
So one of the key teachings of the classical Shaiva Tantra was that of these three upayas, upayas, or skillful means to liberation. And in fact, the, this, <clears throat> this concept of upayas actually does, does appear in, in Buddhism as well. Yeah. Not an expert on that, but when I was looking up the term up, I did find out that uh, it's also um, a term used in the Buddhist tradition. There are three different modes of cultivating liberative awareness. Though they are distinct, you know, they all lead to that same goal. Yeah. So that's an important point that's just been re established here, reiterated, that all the different paths that we may take are all leading to that same goal, that of samavesha, which means immersion, continuous immersion, immersion into divine reality. And this goal can be reached through those three means that I've mentioned. The, Shamba, the Shambhava Upaya, the divine means. And again, we'll break these down a little bit in a moment, but that's the means of non-conceptual intuition. Let's put it very briefly. And then we have the Shakta Upaya, the empowered means. And that's the method that emphasizes working with the energy the shakti of beliefs or thought constructs and the feelings that they produce. And then finally, we have the embodied means, the anava upaya. And that's the method that works with the body, the embodied means. With the physical body and the subtle body, we're talking about both here, through various kinds of yogic practices. So those are the yogic practice, practices as we more commonly know them. Um, although I should, I might, I might may just point out here that Abhinava Gupta doesn't talk about yoga, yoga postures, asanas, um, here or I believe anywhere in his writing, because at this time, asana was still a term reserved for seated postures. I mean, in, I mean, historically, actually, the earliest mentions of non-seated non postures, non-seated asanas, actually come from around this period, about the 11th century. But uh, there's, no, there's no signs that Abhinavagupta knew about them. However, that doesn't mean that if if he did talk about them, then I'm sure he would have been have a good to would agree that they fall within this category of the embodied method, the embodied means. More commonly, the goal is reached through practice in all three upayas, yeah? either simultaneously or sequentially. Most likely, start, starting from the embodied means working into the empowered means and then into the divine means. Um, and we can talk about this more later on, but I find people often say that, uh, yeah. I find, I've often heard people say that, uh, you know, they, could, they enter on, into the yogic path, the spiritual path, through the more embodied practices of yoga, asana, and then from there into the more and more subtle techniques. So I would say it's more likely yeah, to happen that way around. In fact, the tantric tradition argues that no spiritual path can be complete that emphasizes one upaya to the exclusion of the other two. Now this next paragraph, I'm coming back to <laughs> because I think it, it's just a little bit of a, it's an interesting tangent that's 
has some good discussion points, but it doesn't really add to the understanding of the upayas. And then also this table here, I'm coming back to, because I think that would, at this point, that can just com complicate matters. So we're now looking at page, the second page. Since tantric practice seeks nothing less than a total integration of the disparate parts of our being, that is the realization of ourselves as an undivided unitary mass of awakened consciousness. It makes sense that the tradition discusses tantric sadhana or practice as something that must function on all three levels, body, heart, mind, and spirit. So just notice for a moment, this you, you often hear in, in modern day spirituality about uh, uh, body, mind, body, the term body, mind, and spirit. Um, and these, you can see these three, three upayas in a way as correlating with those three layers, those three aspects of the person, body, mind, and it's called heart mind here because um, in Indian philosophy, those two things are, are considered, they're not separated like they often are in Western thought, where you have the heart and the mind as two separate things. They're connected here. And spirit. So even if we primarily pursue one of those three modes, it must necessarily come to entail the other two in order to achieve that aim. As we progress in practice, these three distinct aspects of our being, body, mind, spirit, start to seem less and less distinct until, as Abhinava Gupta says, the nectar of blissful self-awareness floods and overflows the internal dams that divide us, dis dissolving all distinctions. And then you become that undivided self. You experience yourself as one whole, a unified whole, a blissful self-aware consciousness. And not just momentarily, but ideally, um, you know, having that, having that feeling more and more until it becomes your norm, natural, no, normal day-to-day -day state of being. So having a, another look, a little bit of a closer examination of that first method, the, the Shambhada Upaya, the divine means. So, so, well, first of all, before you even get to that, of course, just to remind you, you've also got that non the Anava Upaya, um, the non means. Um, i.e. The, the, the path to awakening that basically doesn't in, even involve any method at all. It's just like direct. <laughs> and we'll have a look more at that in chapter two, if we get to that today. But assuming as almost everybody does, you need some degree of method, then this is the next closest to that. Um, and, and here there's still not very clear um, method. Um, so it's more of a, an, an like a non-conceptual intuition, what we're talking about here. So learning how to open to grace. And how to be open to, uh, to your essence nature in every moment. Non-conceptual moment-to-moment -moment awareness of your inner state. The fluctuations of your feelings, thoughts, emotions. 
and seeing them essentially as vibrations, energetic vibrations. And then finally, the internalization of the non-conceptual essence of mantras. Yeah, so in this divine means, ma mantras are used, but in a completely non-conceptual way. So, without, so we're talking here really about the use of, particularly of like bija mantras. You know, there's little tantric bija mantras that don't have any, that don't actually have any literal conceptual meaning. So that's the divine means for now. We can maybe have a have another closer look at that. And of course we will have a closer look at it when we get to chapter three, which is all about it. And chapter three of the text is I'll give you a fair warning now, it's it's a it's a hard going <laughs> chapter. Because to, de to describe this divine means, um, Abhin Avagupta does dip into some um, kind of esoteric Sanskrit linguistic mysticism. So that will be interesting to explore. Um, and I look forward, I look forward to, to preparing that and sharing it with you when the time comes. Um, it's very, it's very interesting. It fur, fur, furthers one's understanding as well of, of Sanskrit. But for now, let's have a look at this empowered means, the next means, the uh, Shakta Upai. So this means largely focuses on undermining false, so we talked about this earlier, those false or disempowering mental constructs. Those, con those constructs that tend towards dual dualistic thinking. By cultivating those views on reality that are profoundly empowering due to being more aligned with the nature of things. Vikalpa Samskara. So, if the next means is the means of the body, then I like to think of this empowered means as kind of the means mainly focused on using the mind. So this is a path that someone, someone like me is, is very attracted to. Um, not that it involves reading lots and lots because it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it does, it does mean listening to or reading teachings, wisdom teachings, and reading them enough again and again and again, listening to them again and again and again, until you really start to live and understand the truth of them. So first of all, there might just be conceptual teachings, um, and you can say, oh, I don't understand that. But then a little bit later, you might think, oh, actually, yes, I'm starting to understand that on a conceptual level. But what we're looking for, of course, here is to move beyond just that conceptual understanding, but really feeling them deeply yeah, and living those teachings. So that's, why I con that's, how, I, that's how I see that. Yeah. That's how I see that path. Um, that continue exposure to uh, wisdom teachings. And then we have this next method, the, um, I think I may have, yeah, Anava no, Upaya, the embodied means. And this is the means that primarily consists of, of, of yoga in the way that we normally understand it. In all the forms that are known today, and of course that can mean our asana too, even if it, it maybe didn't, to Abhinavagupta himself. Well, it certainly means all those other methods such as uh, um, pranayama and working with the energy body, tantric practices such as 
Ajapa Jap, um, Uchara, um, and other ones like that that, that utilise the energy body. And I've been having, when we get to that chapter, which will be some time away, but it's, well, of course you can read ahead and <laughs> if you want to, but uh, yeah, that'll be very interesting, chapter five, because uh, that's where I've been having up to do is actually give some practices. Um, and they're interesting kind of unique spins on existing tantric practices um, so they're well worth an explore the embodied means i.e doing yoga ultimately leads hopefully to increased softness and flexibility in one's opinions and mental construct in other words, it naturally leads you towards the empowered means and towards awakening. And if it doesn't, then according to the tantric view, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so we can talk about, more about that perhaps. Um, can you do, I mean, yeah, that, that would be a contentious point, wouldn't it? Can you do yoga wrong? Well, It's conceivable and, and, and maybe quite likely that lots of people engage in yoga practices such as their asana, etc., but aren't necessarily getting much closer to liberation, to awakening. Which doesn't mean, yeah, anyway, we can talk about that in a moment <laughs> if, you, if you should want to. So finally, we should note that the root teaching here is to, is to do what works and do everything that works. Okay. Which, which of these means, you know, most resonates with you? And in, within those means, which practices most resonate with you? Upaya could also be translated as effective method or even a situationally sensitive methodology. No teacher is effective without an instinctive grasp of Upaya, for Upaya always takes the principle of for who and when into account. In other words, a given teaching or practice, however true or effective, is right for a certain person at a state, certain stage of development. An interesting point here that goes wider than, than yeah, that has wider social consequences. When an educational system does not grasp this principle, it severely undermines its avowed goals. As a former American public school teacher recently pointed out in a heartfelt cry that may be summarized is, what is education without upaya? <laughs> that is, well, the school teacher didn't say that, um, but that's what it can be summarized as, i.e., what is education without this recognition of the need of the, the, the various students in front of you and their different needs? It's uh, obviously a reference to this common feature in modern educational systems of one size has to fit all. Um, without recognizing that people learn in different ways or learn in a different, uh, you know, different rate speeds. So, yeah, well, that was quite an uh, interesting point that you might want to further reflect upon. And then just to be complete, we'll skip back to that earlier paragraph and table that I missed out before. So this is this comes where, um, while well, this is pointing out that the no spiritual path can be complete if it emphasizes just one upaya, um, one method, one teaching. 
And he goes on to say, this might explain why many religions do not succeed in producing spiritual awakening, or at least not very often, because they focus almost exclusively, um, for example, on the rituals and good works of Arnava Upaya, i.e. Catholicism, uh, mainstream Hinduism, or popular Buddhism. Or on the centrality of salvific beliefs and positivistic thinking of Shakta Upaya, i. in the case of the what it says of Protestant Christianity, Vedanta or the New Age movement. Or maybe too much reliance, too much reliance on non-conceptual modes to shift awareness out of conditioned thought and into direct perception. And the only example he gives here is some forms of Zen, um, yeah, which, oops. Well, the argument here, of course, is that it, it, well, it fa Zen famously uses, you know, non-conceptual uh, teachings, um, and that might be seen as a potential limitation here. But rather than use the teachings on the upayas to critique religion, it is more effective to use it to increase the effectiveness of one's individual spiritual practice, which whatever tradition one practices within. And then there's this little table here. Um, so, the three means, of course, on the left, three upayas on the left hand side. On the next row, it's lit, you know, I, I talked about those shaktis earlier on, five shaktis. Well, these are linked to the three, three of them the power of willing, the power of knowing, and finally the power of acting. So there's all these kind of correspondences in, in tantric yoga. Um, and then level of experience, um, if what for one in the Shambhada Upaya, you know, you're, you're, well, to be in the Shambhava Upaya, then most of the time you're already experiencing this unity. Um, maybe not all of the time, but a significant amount of the time. In the Shakti or Shakta Upaya, you're experiencing a bit of both unity in, di in diversity. And in, if your practice mode is mainly the Anava Upaya, the embodied means, uh, you may, the level of experience may still be largely plural, plurality, with maybe occasional, occasional glimpses of unity yeah, when the going's good. The aspect of self, we've already had a look at those, that linkage with spirit, with body, mind and spirit. And then process. Um, the Shamba, well, the, the non-means, which isn't on this table, is yeah, completely immediate. Uh, and the Shamba, the Upaira is also pretty immediate. Um, maybe just a short time spent with a teacher, a guru, a few teachings. And then the Shakti Rupaya is more step by step, but with you know, sudden revelations. And then the Anava Rupaya is a much more gradual step by step process, or kra Krama. Krama means a, a sequence, a gradual sequence. So, Yeah, quite a lot to take in perhaps on that table or not. Does it all seem very clear? Well, anyway, now we can have a discussion about what, what I've just been talking about. So, yes, please feel free to <laughs> unmute yourself and ask any questions or raise any points. I mean, maybe just to start off, I, I would ask, um, 
does it at least does at least this general idea of there being different teachings different methods different paths yeah. you know for different people at different times does that seem to make does that seem to be a good way of thinking yeah. seems I, to be right i think it, yeah i think it's a good way of thinking um and in particular i think it needs to be culturally you said situ, situ, situation what was that what, what did it say situ, i think it needs to be culturally sensitive as well because i find because this comes from india i think a lot of people find what well, i do in particular sometimes find that hard to connect with certain things because it doesn't so situationally sensitive but maybe as well as culturally situationally as as well as depending on what country mm. you come from because well, but when when we get to that uh, when we get to the divine means then yeah because that requires that you know really requires some that chapter in particular requires an understanding of the Sanskrit. Sanskrit. Really. Of Sanskrit, yeah. Really, to fully grasp it. But, uh, so if you, if you went back hmm. into the times when Abhinavagupta was first, you know, writing all of this, hmm. and since what we've just been talking about is practice as opposed to the philosophies in a sense or when i say the philosophies the the things like the tattvas and the vax and the, the, the powers of speech <laughs> yeah all of, would they would they would the practitioners of needed to have known all of that mm. would they have known all of that <clears throat> well obviously i can't give a definitive answer <laughs> to your question until i've <laughs> developed time travel but uh, <laughs> um no i i i'm work on the assumption that uh that on, only you know a, a small number of practitioners such as Abhinavagupta and other scholars would have been had a full you know awareness of the philosophy behind it um, whereas the the majority of the rest of the practitioners might have had some understanding but yeah not of, mm. of the philosophy but not of, yeah have not a full understanding perhaps yeah I mean, it's. I mean, the tantra was support. I mean, it, I mean, pe people are always um, saying, you know, it, it was a householder tradition. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, it's. An, I mean, it certainly seems like it was. And if that's the case, then I mean, how many, how many, how many of them would have, you know, had the time to to uh you know to study all of that philosophy in great depth really i mean i've been having a to could because uh, you know he didn't have to i mean he, he received patronage he received patronage from the king of Kashmir you, at the time so do you believe that people do still need a guru <laughs> Well, um, I mean, there are. The, I mean, there, there's radical strands even in the ancient tantric tradition that um, negate the need for an actual, you know, physical guru. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I well, it's it's really. I think it's very helpful yeah, and important to have to have teachers. Yes. Yeah, maybe different teachers at different times uh, um, along the way um, depending on your own place in the path um, but yes it's uh, 
it is a it's a challenge it, it's a it can be a very challenging one can't it for for many people and you have <laughs> i'm sure you have thoughts jen <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, I sort of swing in and out myself. So, so at one point I I wanted to have teachers, and then I went off teachers and gurus, and then I really, and then the last decade I wanted, I wanted to have like someone that really inspired me, and um, and then and then and then I thought I found them, and then and then I've gone off them again. So, so. So, so I find my path is, I, 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 for me, I think because I want the person to have such high integrity and then I get really upset when they don't have that high, I find out that they don't do something the way I, and then it upsets me and then, and then I find it really difficult. So, um, but my experience has been like, I wouldn't be teaching. I've had some amazing teachers, gurus, um, whatever name you, you want to call. And then I've had like, and I, you know, when Ben describes the text, like sometimes like when one of my teachers used to sing to me just through him doing like a kirtan and I could feel like everything that was described in this talk today, those three methods, I just felt completely, you know, I felt boundless and expansive and, and like filled with love and divinity. And that was just from him singing to me. Mm -hmm. I've, I've even had like experiences um, like that. So. I recognize that there is great value in having having teachers but I also yeah I, I have like a love-hate relationship <laughs> with, with that I find it really difficult sort of thing so yeah what are you saying Sarah I can't hear you no, unmute yourself Sarah uh, yeah sorry hi hold on. unmute I, I can do it ah okay yeah Joe I completely you know, I completely understand where you're coming from. It's just, you know, that moving around of different gurus, I think it's a really, a really positive thing to do than just follow one guru because even though I guess I guess from well, I guess for me, um, to follow a guru where it's a purely bhakti, but from a place of love is um i think for for me i felt if it, there's too much sort of jhana and without the bhakti it's um there's sometimes maybe it's a reflection in my mind i don't know maybe i see some l lack of sincerity maybe mm. um i don't know did you watch the the, the documentary wild wild country yes. about Show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean that was so interesting wasn't it you know and I think there's real value about sort of moving from different gurus just to get a real sense of 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 where you feel in life where you are on your own journey in your own pathway whether it's you feel that connection with with uh Bhakti or or Japa or um but I, I do feel like Definitely, there's value to having a guru. Yeah. Um, a dip in and dip out. Yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 So it's great listening to Ben because you can be my guru for tonight. So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> they are mine absolutely all day long. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Dropped yeah, into I, the most I, amazing state after that um, Five Directions class again yesterday when I did it, Ben. Mm. Just amazing. Oh good, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Sarah. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And we watched the Bikram one as well, sort of thing. So that I, I think I'd like to find like a really powerful woman goddess, but it's really hard to find really inspiring women yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. My, I had a beautiful teacher over in Spain. She um she followed the uh, uh, Swami Satchinanda and uh, she was, well, she was a family friend of Satchinanda. What's her and, um, She's called Nalini Chalaram. Oh, and she, yeah, she's done yeah, lots of amazing work and uh, humanitarian work and she's an incredible teacher. So, um, 
um, yeah, it's just it's special when you find somebody, isn't it, that can continue with those teachings. And yeah. I'm very lucky that she kind of came into my life, really. Yeah, um, that's nice when it happens serendipitously, isn't that sort of thing? So. Yeah. yeah, and I kind of, I visited the ashram in uh, America and I spent quite some time there and it's, it really allows you to kind of delve really deep and, uh, you know, it's, I came away almost, yeah, it's a strange experience, but I agree to find a really great female guru out there, I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah, girl power. <laughs> sorry, 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 Ben. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Anna, what was the name? He's connected to his femininity. Femininity. <laughs> femininity. <laughs> what, what was Melanie's surname, please? Halloran. Could you spell that? Um, I believe it is C H A L L E R A M or H A M. Not Thank, you. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, it should be, it's probably fairly clear by now that when my, one of my t teachers uh, is Harish Wallace. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't refer to, I mean, I don't re refer to him as my, my guru, but um, he's certainly been a very influential teacher. Um, Acharya is the san is a Sanskrit word that means teacher, um, and yeah, and, and I guess that's just because he combines this. Well, he's a, he's a very is at the same time a very good scholar, but uh, he's also obviously spent many a long time actually. Living, living the path and, and practicing also. So. Has, the, has he only done the recognition sutras online, Ben, or is he? Or is there is there a book of those as well? Yeah, there's a book. Yeah, it's published. Is it? The recognition sutras. Yeah. Okay, right. Highly recommend that. Yeah. Have you got it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been great to have time to read it, to read the Tantra Illuminated more. I, I only got so far with it years ago um, and I've been able to read a lot more of it because of all this time that we've had, which is what I wanted to do with the time. So that's been brilliant. And even still, <laughs> I've, I've only sort of, I've not read to still, just short of 200 pages because you just have to keep re going back and back or i do have to yeah. you said that, go back and back and back yeah. and it's great to do that because sometimes i'll read i'll read a, a page and i i can't get it at all and then you can go back at a different time and it starts to click and it's yeah, well, I've done the I've done the same thing. I mean, I've read the full book uh, at least two or three times, but then I've also gone back and read particular sections numerous yeah. times. Yeah, and that's great then because then I then I sort of see why we do certain things in class and why you know oh yeah that's why you say that and that's why we're doing this and yeah it's good. Right, so is there any other things before we just quickly have a look at day two? <laughs> well, <Sorry. laughs> chapter two. Oh, oh hi, <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> hey, Saraswati. She's your one, she's our guru. <laughs> she's our guru. Yes, we are. I mean, it, it, it is anyhow a very, this day, chap, day two or chapter two is, is anyway very short. Um, but, and I've got time to go into great detail on it, but I'll read through it, yeah. I thought it was worth just having that kind of um, 
diversion into looking at the three old pines before we went any further with the text itself. So I won't read out all the, <laughs> I won't try reading out all the, the Sanskrit now. Now, Atta, so that's a, that's a word of, in itself <laughs> of some um, spiritual significance. Man, many Sanskrit texts start, including the Yoga Sutra, start with that word, Atta, now. Bringing us right in, into the present moment. Now then, we will explain the spontaneous mode of realization, requiring no method. The, me the no method method. A person has, who has truly been pierced by this strong descent of power or shakti part. So we mentioned that word earlier on. It's a significant word in the tradition. Um, it's that, it's that descent, de, well, Shakti means power of course, and yeah, Pata is descending, the descent of power that leads to our initial, very initial awakening. Yeah, so b before you even seek out a guru, you know, it's that very first stirring that actually leads us on to the spiritual path in the first place. That's what the Shakti path originally is. And for some people, it's very gradual, of course. And Abhinavagupta describes nine grades, you know, nine, nine different levels of Shakti path. So it can be very gradual, you know. <laughs> you know, it can just take years and years and years and years. Or on the other extreme, it can just be like sudden, like you know, a bolt of lightning out of the blue. Um, somebody has suddenly, you know, strongly re received this strong awakening. Um, maybe because of some life situation, maybe some near-death experience, perhaps, you know, or something of something like that. So, yeah, there's. This is talking about a person, a such a person who has been pierced by a strong Shakti path. And, the, and just to say, this, Shakti, this word Shakti path has continued into the present day. So you hear some gurus, about some guru, mod, more modern gurus, giving Shakti path. So, for example, I believe that Swami Muktananda used to give mass Shakti Pat to people who gathered round. But that's not the way it was conceived in the original tradition. Um, it's not something that could be given in that way. Um, you know, you either receive it or, or you don't. And if you receive it, then that's what makes you start walking the path and, and, and seek, seeking out a guru in the first place. So such a person then may receive verbal transmission from his teacher only once and with no further support discerns the true nature of reality. And when this occurs, his or her immersion into reality becomes permanently active, nichiodita, ever refreshing itself without any necess necessity for formal practice. You know, so they might still choose to do that formal practice anyhow, but no necessity for it as such. Can be asked so this is a common technique and i've been having up to uses it often where he gives a um you know a potential criticism an argument against that somebody could make given that in that potent you know imaginary student says given that in this system discernment is itself one of the limbs of yoga how can it be said that he discerns the truth without method? So just to clarify that, it's talking about here about the tantric limbs of yoga, the sadhanga, and not about the ashtanga of Patanjali, which are many people are, more people are familiar with that. In tantric yoga, we have this thing called the sadhanga, the six limbs of yoga. Um, 
And the, the actual list does vary a little bit depending on tradition again, depending on lineage. But typically there's no, well, yamas and yamas aren't there. They've been taken out. Not because tantricas weren't interested in ethical behavior, but that just appears somewhere else. It doesn't appear here. So the yamas and yamas aren't there and asana's not there in the sadanga. But one thing that is there is this taka, yeah? Taka, discernment, that I've named these sessions after. And that's that discernment of the truth. So the students just, um, yeah, saying that in the, in, in, in the path itself, it says that we need this discernment as one of the limbs. Um, so how, how can you at the same time be saying that you can reach awakening, liberation, you know, without using <laughs> any method? Oops, so I keep pressing, I keep clicking on the wrong scroll, the wrong scroll bar. Um, and this is the reply. This very highest divinity, the self manifest light of consciousness is what I am. When that is the case, what could any method of practice achieve? Not the attainment of my true nature because that is eternally present. Not making it known because it is already illuminating itself. Not the removal of ob obscurations because no obscuration whatsoever actually exists. And not the entry into it, because to enter into it, I would have to be other than it. And nothing other than it exists to enter in from. So what method or practice can there be here when there is an impossibility of anything separate from that which I am? And then what's given next is essentially a, a, one of those wisdom teachings. One of those teachings that if you could fully understand it, not just, as I said, not just conceptually, as in, oh yes, I, I, think, I, under, I think I've worked that out, I understand that, but rather feeling it really deeply in the core of your being yeah. and again not just for a moment or two but continuously then you would have reached this awakening without without method just with this just with this one teaching so i'm going to give that teaching to you now and we're going to do this more as a meditation, this bit. So, see what comes of it. See what comes of it. See if you see how. And just before I do it, uh, even, just because this particular paragraph, this particular teaching, it, it doesn't connect with you, it doesn't resonate with you. That doesn't mean, um, you know, <laughs> that's the end of it uh, for you. You have to try a different methods. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just written in the wrong way. Maybe, the, maybe it's just the right teaching, but it's written and it's just form, formed in the wrong way. But I invite you to be open to the possibility that this one, you know, open to the possibility that this one teaching could lead you to full permanent awakening open to that possibility at least so the eyes are closed for this one and i will read it out twice and of course the eyes are closed and you've dropped into gentle stillness Take some time just to notice the flow of the breath. So 
sinking deeply into a place where you can be open and receptive to the following words. <clears throat> Everything is one. All this is a single reality consisting of consciousness alone, free and blissful, unbroken by time, uncircumscribed by place, unclouded by attributes or adjuncts, unconfined by forms or appearances, unexpressible by words, and not unfolded by the ordinary means of knowledge. For it is the cause through its will alone by which time, space, forms, and so on, each attain their, their own natures. This reality is free and independent a mass of bliss, and that, that alone am I. Everything is reflected within it, within me. Everything is one. All of this is a single reality consisting of consciousness alone, free and blissful, unbroken by time, uncircumscribed by place, unclouded by attributes or adjuncts, unconfined by forms or appearances, unexpressible by words, and not unfolded by the ordinary means of knowledge. For it is the cause through its own will alone by which time, space, forms, and so on each attain their own natures. This reality is free and independent, a mass of bliss, and that alone am I. Everything is reflected within it within me. For one who discerns thus with firm certainty, there quickly comes about a highest divinity immersion. without the need for any further practice. Such a one is bound by no constraints relative to mantra, puja, meditative visualization, observances, and so on. And in summary, the whole network of methods, the whole network of methods could not reveal God. Can a pot illumine the thousand rayed sun? Discerning the truth thusly, one with the highest insight can immerse into the state of the self luminous Shiva in an instant. And then very finally, as it does in all of the chapters, Abhinavagupta then gives a version of what he's just said in, in a simpler way, in, in a simpler language, in Prakrit. And so not many people, only, only a small percentage of people in ancient times, could 
read and speak Sanskrit. It was a, a, an elite language. Most people spoke a vernacular language, such as Prakrit. And to make the teaching accessible to them, he gives, always gives this final verse in Prakrit. And it also gives the teaching in its, also in its most raw, simplest form as well, without any of the, without any of the philosophical you know, language. So may, have a listen to this. Any manifestation that manifests is the complete and stainless highest divinity shining in me. Ultimately, that is my very own self. Having known this, there is nothing more to be done. Any manifestation that manifests is the complete and stainless highest divinity shining in me. Ultimately, this is my very own self. Having known this, there is nothing more to be done. Continue for a few, a little longer, residing in that deep stillness and perhaps reflecting upon those teachings, those words. And allowing one's awareness to return to the breath. And the ebb and flow of the breath within the body. And then becoming aware of your physical body. That body which, according to this way of thinking, this philosophy is just as much, just as much a part of the divine as everything else, of course. Your wondrous body. And then, can slowly bring yourself back into your surroundings by slowly opening the eyes, making little movements. So I'm not going to ask if anybody's <laughs> 
suddenly <laughs> reached enlightenment. But if anybody, would anybody like to offer any thoughts, reflections upon that? So. Um, if I may then, just, well, thank you again. Um, so when, um, when he summed it up at the end about what he was talking about, about mm. any, any manifestation that manifests as a divinity um, within me, um, and then he says, I think you said, ultimately, this is my very own self. Yes. So yes. immediately that made me think quite individualistic when he said, this is my very own self, when actually he's meaning the divine, which is every, everything. Is that right? This is, yeah, this, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, well, it, it's self Writ here with a written with a you know a capital S. <laughs> yeah, the higher self, <laughs> the, the divine. Not the uh, not the self that we normally consider ordinarily yeah. consider. But it, it just I, I understand that he's meaning the whole yeah. that we're all made of the self. Yeah. But he said this is well, sometimes, my very own. Sometimes yeah language can the language we use can get in the way, can't it? And I suppose That's it's been thing. translated into English as well. Yeah. So there's no doubt, I mean, I haven't, Okay, I just, I'm I just not, got yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I, obviously I, I, I can't say what, what word, well, it's being translated here without the, uh, and then interestingly where he says, having known this, there is nothing more to be done. That might answer Tracy's question earlier where you were saying you know once you've got there what what more is there to do is, is that right how could you go any further if that's yeah and he's saying there's nothing more to be done you can't go any further is, is that right i don't know well i mean Um, I mean, he, I mean, obviously, that's just, that's assuming that this realization is a last is a lasting one and not just a moment momentary one. Um, there's something that you're kind of you're in that place. <laughs> you're living from that place, you know, all the time. And then, then yes, then spiritually speaking, there is nothing, there's nothing more, yeah, that, that, that to be done, <laughs> that can be done, which obviously isn't saying that we shouldn't, that we should just sit and do nothing. <laughs> it's very, very definitely not saying that. Um, we should continue to do and create. And, but we do so, yeah, from that place of, yeah. N deep connection. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I mean, do people, how do people feel about it? I mean, do you think it's a, a, a reasonable, a plausible idea that somebody could reach away, full away, this full away and lasting awakening just from one encounter with a guru, one teaching? Or would such a person need to have done lots of prior um, work, self-development work? I think, it's similar, I think it's similar to what Joe was saying about um, different cultures and different situations. If we're living in a very materialistic Western world, we might, our mental attitude might be a little bit more sceptical 
or questioning, whereas mm. um, people who've been brought up with other in other situations, um, and other lesser distractions or whatever, um, might might see it as more achievable. I also think maybe you don't need a guru. Maybe those you can have that descent just from what well, you already mentioned. From if you experience great mm -hmm. grief or trauma or or great beauty, mm -hmm. you could be just be walking out in the woods and and then it could just happen or something like that, couldn't it? It doesn't necessarily have to be given to you from a, a human being teacher, does it? Yeah, it could be given to you. It could be. I mean, by a tree or, or a mountain yeah. or a cloud or yeah. I mean, you've and you've, and you've mentioned think, before that experience you had just lying up on the grass when I was something. a child. Yeah, yeah. it when sounds five, yeah. like it, it sounds to me like it was a a shakti pat. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but yeah, I was mm. just in nature. So. And uh, I think for me, my my sort of really happy childhood memories of being like really close to nature. And then I think the, the, the similarities of like the guru pathway with certainly the, certainly, um, you know, the self surrender and the divine nature was, uh, the similarity was, took me back to those childhood mm. sort of memories of, of being close to nature and certainly, you know, when I'm out walking all the time and hiking and those vibrations that I feel, I definitely feel those divine, um, you know, those divine feelings. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, which, you know, doesn't need to come from color. No, I yeah. keep that one, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, you know, you hit sort of, you know, you reach sometimes that sort of awareness. Well, do you know whether you've reached awareness? And, Maybe at some point in in your life you hit some sort of you know trauma or really deep uh, wounding event, and and then the teachings just all come flooding back to you. And and yeah, I mean the awakeness is it has been there, and it's it's all coming out at a later point. Um, so we can certainly mm. you know do we reach it in a, in one moment? I'm, I'm not I'm not sure about, about that. We, Maybe we do, but just don't know it at the time. And at some point later in life, we look back and think. <laughs> but I guess that's where humility comes in as well, because mm -hmm. like a lot of gurus as well. That's what, like what we were saying earlier. A lot of gurus don't seem to have that humility. Some of them, once they get their their following and stuff like that, seem to lose that aspect of it. Um, I think, anyway, my experience has been. Um, so it's quite nice to be humble, isn't it, as mm -hmm. well? Um, especially. I know when I go, go on. So I know I have a, a client who I've um, been seeing for a while now. She's she's just like moved on to um, an AA program, and she the way that she described the program that she's going through um, is really um, quite unbelievable. How it's very relatable to the whole sort of guru pathway and, and um, much of these teachings and I kind of think well who put this AA program together because it's very much about self-surrender and and finding the divine within and uh, I don't know much about AA programs but I was really interested to kind of hear about that so mm. can you know you see how yoga therapy can really help so many people in different ways mm. And um, yeah, they find a way of, I guess, the, the, the three different approaches. You connect where you are in your life journey. I guess you choose which, which one you connect with at that particular time. I guess there's no, there's no order, is there, in which we should connect with them. And as long as, I guess, the idea is to connect with them all, but in no particular order, just where we are right now. Mm. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? For me, I think the more practice that I do and the more that I learn from, you know, 
reading and Joe and Ben and listening to some of the other people that I like to listen to, like Christopher Wallace, it's just everything starts to make much more sense. And I've probably had to come at it from, I don't know, from, from, a, from a different angle, probably. I don't know. Um, I couldn't, I don't think it would have worked for me just in one go. I'm sure, I'm sure it hasn't, but it's been certainly consistent, you know, working over, over time and making more sense of things. But somewhere in this book, and I can't find it at the moment, um, there is a list that Christopher Wallace makes of um, how you might feel different points of how you might feel if you've had um, a much slower or a much more sort of step-by-step -step, um, Shaktipata. Things like you no longer enjoy doing the things that you used to and those, sort, those sorts of things. Um, and I would say, you know, I can go down that list and think, yep, 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 no not yet you know it's a, a gradual gradual thing for me but that's great the lifetime well lifetime. <laughs> i wish the one the one the one wish if i have a wish about it but i do i do believe very much now that um it finds you at the right time. But if I could say that I wished it had happened to me a lot earlier so that I had more time, that's what, that's what I would wish. Well, it's, uh, it's it's been very, it's very wonderful to have you along. And Thank you. All the things that we've shared yeah, together. And great. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm very, very grateful. I feel very, very blessed and very lucky. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, no, thank you. For Lovely to see you, ladies. <laughs> Lovely to see you. I feel exactly the same. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining and making it special, especially during this time. I feel I'm like I was thinking when I was coming down, like, and I want to cook and feed everybody. Yeah. <laughs> we can't smell it over the internet, isn't it? <laughs> like, that, that's the uh, the downfall of Zoom, isn't it? We don't get the uh, the the all the sensory things. We need smell o vision. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Oh, God. How's your mum and dad, Joe? Are they okay? Yeah, they're okay. Yeah, yeah. It's last I, I spoke to my mum today and I spoke to my dad last week. They're fine, thank you. Because yeah. they're doing well over there, aren't they, with it? The Greeks in Australia are doing very well with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. They handled it, but they put it every. We just went into lockdown super quick, didn't we? So, mm. so, strong government, strong leadership. So. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, let's not talk about that. No, no, I'm just glad yeah. they're all right. <laughs> so are you, are you closing? What are you closing with then? Um, well, I thought we'd... Well, I, I, I did have the harmonium ready, but uh, I think what we'll do is, uh, as time is moving along quite quickly... How's this in there? Yeah, but we will we will we will close by looking at the man. This uh, oh no, I don't have it open. So we'll close with we'll close with a little poem here yeah? okay. and a mantra. That's what we'll do. So if you just bring yourself to stillness, and again, you may choose to close the eyes. Mm. 
listen to the following words. You cannot teach spirituality. It cannot be taught. You can teach people spiritual practices. They are good. They help us to refine the consciousness, to refine the mind, and to make it more receptive to subtle truths. But each one of you must find your magicality. The seed has to flower in you. It has to burst open. It has to blossom in you, this seed of freedom. If it is only practice, then your mind is doing it. Because the message here is not merely a philosophical message. It is a direct guidance. And it has tremendous power for the one who takes it for the one who swallows the pill. But if you keep it in your mouth, if you gargle and spit it out, then it is no more effective than wine tasting. But this is not wine tasting spirituality, where, where you gargle and you spit it out, and then you write something about wine and move on to the next thing. No, you must get drunk on it. You have to swallow all of it, drown it. So that's attributed to Muji. And then the mantra is the one that we explored earlier on, the um, Niralambaya. Mantra. So this time, if you'd like, if you'd like to, then you can um, join in after me. I'll chant. One, I'll chant it once, and then you can repeat after me. Om Namah Shivaya Gurave. Sat. Chittananda Murtaye Nishprapanchaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase If you'd like to join in. If you. Om Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtai Nishprapanchaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase Another one. Am Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtai Nishprapanchaya Shantaya Niralambaya Tejase Niralambaya Tejase Niralambaya Tejase Three arms together.
if you should like. You can start to rub the hands together. And then by doing so, you, you create heat between the hands. And then of course you cut the hands over the closed eyes. And you receive that warmth, gently starting to open the eyes. And then maybe massaging the face, forehead, temples, the jaw. And then and bring in, eventually bring in the hands together at the heart space. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Great to be with you. Miss you. you. Lots of love. Take Lots care. Of love. See and you I'll soon. Be, Bye. I'll, I'll be in touch about yeah, when the next, <laughs> our next meetings are. Yeah. Lovely. Look forward to it. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye. Good night. Sweet dreams. Good night.